Welcome to the Bombay Bar Podcast. This is a show where we share the rich history of the Bombay Bar Association through its members, both past and present. I'm senior advocate Daraz Kambata and I will be your host on this episode. Today, we have retired Justice Suresh Gupte on our show. Now, he was the first person in his family to pursue law and despite some insecurities early in his career, which you'll hear about, Justice Gupte, as we know, would not only go on to be a successful lawyer, but was asked thrice to take up judgeship before his elevation as a judge of the Bombay High Court in 2013. His judgments, as we have all read, are hallmarks of simplicity, clarity of thought and nuance of law. But they are also subsumed by a strong sense of justice. It, it's nice to be able to talk to you and to find out about the person behind the judge. Uh, so let, let's start with why you came into this field at all. What made you choose law as your profession? Well, this this goes back to my childhood, actually. You know, as a small child, you know, probably in my primary school, it was my grandfather. And I was those days, I my grandfather had a great influence on me. And, you know, he used to tell people that I want to make him a judge, not just law. <laughs> oh, oh, I see that. Which I found, yeah. you know, later... Was a rarity, you know. I have heard people say that I want uh, my son to be a lawyer in law, but I have not heard anyone say that I want him to be a judge, except probably maybe judges themselves. So it was he who really, you know, inculcated this this uh, thought in me that I should be a judge, and he actually. Uh, tried to even groom me in that uh, sense, you know, to to become a judge eventually. So that is that was the beginning of uh, my judgeship. So th that's really prophetic of him. <laughs> uh, so if not born to be a judge, you were certainly groomed to be a judge. I, I, and we know that that grooming had great success. Uh, but before we get to that phase of your life, hmm. uh, I'd like to ask you about your childhood. Uh, about when you were in school and college. What were your passions and hobbies at that time? Those days, my first passion was theatre. And, you know, as a, as a schoolboy, I've done many plays. And in college, I was part of the amateur theatre. I've done so many plays. So that, I would say, my first love. And probably I would have entertained this thought that uh, I could possibly make a career in theatre. <laughs> I don't know. But it's interesting that your first love, as you say, was theatre. Yes. Because isn't there something, a little of drama about a courtroom? Absolutely so. You said it. You put your finger on it. Yeah. I think as a lawyer, you know, you need to know drama. <laughs> I remember um, amongst our old stalwarts, you know, Katu Cooper, for example, a way he would address the court, you know, and it was like a performance of an actor, you know, it was so fabulous. You're, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. There's a little bit of an actor in every lawyer. Yeah. And dare I say a act. little bit of a director in every judge? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well said, yes. So you graduated top of your class in law college. Uh, yes, so yes, I did. That didn't apparently at all detract you from your no. commitment to law. That's an interesting story. You know, I, I was a student of Government Law College for the first two years. And uh, at the end of my second year, I was called by the principal. Those days, Professor Balsara was my our principal. And uh, he placed before me an option. He said, uh, either I don't give you the form for your second year exam, or you quit the college and I give you the form. Uh, this was because of attendance. I <laughs> I fell short of my attendance. And by a good margin, let me tell you. That, of course, is common to many <laughs> of us. <laughs> <laughs> I know I had a uh, uh, good many people in, in my company. Uh, so I chose, of course, the other option. I quit my college and I went to New Law College, uh, which I attended only on three occasions. <laughs> First was when I went to seek my admission, the second time when I went to pay my second term fees, and the third time when I went to collect my prize as the, 
the student who had come first in his class. And in, in fact, when I went to the stage to collect my prize, I think uh, Justice Arvind Savant was the uh, the chief guest, and Professor Rege was the principal. When he saw me, he said, I, "I'm not seeing you." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, uh, I am also seeing you, maybe on the second or third time for for the second or third time." So that was that. But uh, I was a good student, yes. But uh, those days I was interested in so many things outside the classroom. And as I said, you know, it are, these are these are the things which really make you as a person, as a you know, a, a yes. person you need to be to be a lawyer or a judge. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, actually, at a certain level, what you just said is very encouraging to juniors because you've just exemplified hmm. why. You don't need necessarily to have a top flight legal education system to become a good lawyer. And because we've all grown up in, in uh, an education system that was not uh, at the top of its uh, form. Of Absolutely. course, now it's different in India. You have the national law schools. But in our time, yes. we didn't have that quality of legal education. And yet India has produced some of the finest lawyers and judges. Absolutely. Yes. So I think you exemplify that in many ways. Yeah. And, you know... Uh, I basically feel, you know, what you need to be both a successful lawyer and a judge is that you need to have a very sound common sense. But mind you, it is the most difficult commodity to come by, you know, though it's, it is. it's the most <laughs> uncommon commodity. Before we get to your very distinguished career as a judge, uh, I want to quiz you a bit about your days at the bar. Uh, let's start from... How you joined the bar? Because I, there is a perception that the bar is a closed shop. It's very difficult for someone who doesn't have family or close relatives uh, in the profession to break into it. And your family had no legal background in that sense. So how did you come to the bar? When we were doing a theater, a friend of mine just in, told me that there's a friend uh, who has an office. He's a lawyer. He has a lawyer's firm. So I'll put in a word with him and uh, he did, he said, yeah, please come. That is how I joined the firm, you know, the, there was a small firm called Varerkar and Varerkar, which I joined as a lawyer. And then when I was working with them, uh, I was doing a matter for uh, Balmohan Vidya Mandir. I still recollect that matter. And uh, <clears throat> where uh, there was some issue relating to article uh, section 145-146 breach of peace provision. It was relating to school premises. And uh, we had engaged C.R. Dalvi, uh, who is a reputed of course, of course. Uh, appellate side uh, senior. And I was assisting him. Those days, I had been in this with this firm for about four years. I was always toying with the idea of getting into council practice which, by the way, I came to know about when I joined the firm. I didn't know there is something like council practice, that there is something like original side, appellate side. But all this I learned, I came to know as I entered the profession. So, as I was telling you, uh, when we were doing this matter, and uh, we, of course, lost before the high court. And then I went to Supreme Court. That's the first visit I made to the Supreme Court in that matter. But... After a few days, uh, Dalvi sent a word through the client. He said, just ask Gupte to see me. And I went to his house in, um, you know, that August Kranti Maidan, that's, that's around right. it. Yeah. <clears throat> and he asked me whether I would like to join him. Because he, he said, I liked your work. And um, I told him that I have no connection to the... Uh, to the districts and I, I don't I don't know anyone I don't know whether I'll get any work so I said I would like to be on the original side he said huh good then I'll speak to Mr. Dada and Dalvi spoke to Mr. Dada and that is how oh I see I joined the chambers of uh, Mr. Dada so I think you very humbly said that you got some lucky breaks <laughs> yes, but I uh, did. you know there also there's the old adage the harder you work the luckier you get uh, and perhaps that in your case again rings true. Uh, 
of course, we remember C. R. Dalvi. His son and I actually were together for our masters, oh. Manoj. <laughs> and of course, C. R. Dalvi was a doyen of He's our. He's a doyen, absolutely. What What are your thoughts on the original side? Because there was again a feeling that it was dominated by those who spoke Gujarati. Yes. Is that Is that true? Yes, yes that was true then. It's not, uh, it's not true, true any longer. That's right. But those days, yes, it was quite an elite bar. And uh, from a middle class Maharashtrian background, you know, I found it a little difficult to, uh, you know, uh, make my uh, way. I did, yes. Again, very humbly put, I somehow <laughs> made it because you were a very successful lawyer as well. I know that. From, Over a period, from, yes, but but I'm talking about the initial days, you know, when these are the days of struggle, which uh, Mr. Dada used to call uh, staring at the books phase. <laughs> I think all, all lawyers have to go through that phase, at least five or ten years of real struggle. And that probably molds and makes uh, yes. a lawyer. Did you have any role models uh, of senior lawyers that you either worked with or you saw in operation? Atul Settleward used to be my hero. You know, I really appreciated him for the clarity of his thought, the you know the precise words that he would use to express those legal principles. And you know, so it was full of substance and yet so pithy. And I really admired that. And I tried to, in a way, inculcate uh, that habit. Then, of course, uh, there was. Uh, uh, Justice Dia Dhanuka, those days he was a reputed senior counsel. And uh, I appreciated, what I appreciated in him was his knack to get to the heart of the matter, you know, and so quickly would he reach that. That is something, again, I tried to uh, kind of emulate. And of course, Rafiq Dada for his uh, felicity of his expression, which I also feel is an important element of a judge's equipment. So now let's get to the second phase, as it were, of your career, the judgeship. Uh, you say that you always had this idea in your head that you would want to become a judge. But after joining the bar, did you have any second thoughts or were you totally dedicated to that ultimate goal? No, I didn't have second thoughts, but um, I, in fact, grabbed the very first opportunity when it came my way. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't go through that time. Um, I, in fact, I was not even 45 when I was first asked. Um, Justice Chandrachud had called me and asked me whether I would take up judgeship and uh, then I took some time because <laughs> when it comes, it hits you. So, and I sat with my wife and uh, we did all the calculations, you know, with the judge's salary, can we live? And uh, we knew we did, did, we wouldn't, but we st I still said yes, And but it didn't go through that time, through the collegium, for reasons unknown to me. As is the situation, in, even now people talk about lack of transparency, etc., etc. So, I didn't know why it didn't happen, but it didn't. And um, then the second time uh, this offer came to me, I said no because there was some there were some personal circumstances which didn't allow me to uh, get into it. So and then I thought I missed the pass finally. But again, uh, I was asked the third time, and uh, then I was uh, I was ready for it. I and would by say, then I had created some economic, some financial cushion for me, which which was good, I believe. So it's, yes. it's a it's a measure of of your clear talent and ability to be a judge that you were asked three times, and third time, lucky I would say for the bar <laughs> that you were accepted. Oh, those uh, are your kind so, words. So uh, thank God for that. Uh, and now let's come to your career as a judge. This was really your metier. You, you, you were groomed to be a judge, as we've heard. Uh, and I, I have to share this with you, that the perception of the bar was then and it remains that you were one of our finest judges. You had the clearest minds. Your judgments were pithy, simple, but direct. Even a layman could understand them. And that is, of course, the hallmark of a great judgment. Uh, how did you... 
approach the writing of judgments because for you for your judgments are unique in their simplicity and clarity i think there are three important elements of a uh for judges endeavor and uh, you know the his his the act of judging the first of course is and the most fundamental is the honesty of purpose and this involves many things it involves uh, personal honesty it involves fierce independence as a judge and it involves commitment to the cause of justice so that all this is subsumed within what i call honesty of purpose the second is clarity of thought and um, for this clarity you need to clear the cobwebs and come to the correct legal situation which you have to deal with and then think of a, a syllogism which is based on a sound legal proposition as the major premise and that's how we work towards your conclusion and the third is um the honesty of purpose the clarity of thought and the third is the fel- felicity of expression you need to be clear you need to be simple you need to be direct you need to be uh precise and i i i value precision a lot as as legal writing i think precision of expression uh, translating your clear thought into a simple direct concise judgment is one of the most important qualities yes that a judge should have and you had it in abundance and in fact it reminds me of what the dean griswold of harvard law school once said that poetry is the true language of a lawyer Oh, wow. uh, because in a few words you have to encapsulate a very complex Absolutely. thought. Absolutely correct. Uh, did you emulate any any judges? You've spoken about Chief Justice Chagla, Chagla but were yes. there any others whom you emulated? I I sat on the bench for the first time. I sat with Justice Chandrachud, who's our present Chief Justice, and I admired the way he handled matters, the way he organized his thoughts, and the way he would dictate his judgment. Uh, there and then after the matter is over i enjoyed a lot of we had a lot of intellectual camaraderie those days you know that the few months i spent with him on the bench that was probably one of my best uh, sittings on the division bench and i in a way i i subconsciously i must have tried to emulate him to what extent i succeeded is another matter but it had a great influence on me and fortunately for me it was my very first sitting and just as uh, the formative days of a judgeship of my judgeship so yes what i really wanted to ask you is many of us lawyers feel that we know the formula of how to get across a point in a matter particularly a complex matter but i question that do we actually know the formula and it would be interesting to hear from you what you expected of a lawyer Uh, and what assistance you expected from a lawyer as a judge in a matter uh assistance yes uh, to the f- i mean fullest extent you know he must bring out everything but let me tell you what a judge really looks you know That's right. in a lawyer the first thing i would look is is he fair fairness i think is the hallmark of the whole system he is not just he doesn't have to be fair only to his client but to the other side and above all to the judge to the society so this this feeling of fairness a lawyer must give secondly uh, he must be his expression must be amiable you know many times the lawyers are so competitive you know some you know they are so noisy at times but this amiable you know expression is something you know you must endear yourself to the judge it's you know many times if you you found even as a as a you know as a commoner that uh, you tend to agree more with people whom you like so that's a that's a psychological phenomena so he must have a i mean an amiable expression and if you see thirdly 
they have got to be attentive many times i have found that uh, the lawyer is full of himself you know he is he has done his case you know it's all in his mind and he wants to somehow you know put everything across you know he is not attentive where the judge is you know how the judge judge's mind is working where would he how would he be able to tackle uh, you know what is troubling the judge so you've got to be attentive you know those three these three qualities i feel are very important in a lawyer you know and the best example you know of this 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 alertness this attentive uh, in this kind of focus is when you see uh, you work with uh, fali nariman you know i've done a lot of work with him he was one lawyer who was always attentive you know absolutely knew where the judge what the judge was thinking that's a great quality you are right sir i i think fali nariman and ashok desai both knew both, the pulse yes. of the court absolutely and they, they swung knew. around they had they remarkable knew what turn the of the judge court. wanted remarkable turn of remarkable court. yeah but i think you make a deeper point in that that you must know your judge because after all a judge is a human being yes and the more complex the matters the less is the answer in black or white there's always shades always, of gray and you've got to get that right shade essentially it is gray yes and and that makes ju- judging so much more difficult as well because it's a matter of judgment yeah uh, and on which side you fall depends on whether you're a good judge or a great judge uh, but i'm very glad that you are the first quality you look for was fairness because judge i have to tell you that there is a perception uh, sadly so that the more aggressive you are the louder you shout uh, and sometimes even uh, the more you suppress inconvenient facts that that is good lawyering which of course is not but i'm glad that as a judge you are also yeah, saying yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. that's that's a complete no no in my court i i i i would never ever appreciated that 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 is so encouraging to hear for, and especially for our junior bar i think that that is really something they should keep in mind yeah. uh but but by the way few ju- juniors did that in my court <laughs> generally i do feel that the bar behaved himself, itself you know in my that's court. right i think i think the bombay high court has a very talented Absolutely. junior bar it's a, it's a no, great no no it's uh, a, the as far as the mid level bar goes bombay has the finest of bars and it's something really a, it's a great ray of hope for the future absolutely uh, but no few talk- are ready to take up judgeship <laughs> that of course is something that has to be inculcated and encouraged but we've talked about your good times as a judge but did you have any difficulties or did you face any quandaries as a judge uh not many times but a few times i did feel you know uh, that even the answer that i am giving is not addressing the 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 real issue but then i felt i am handicapped as a judge uh this is something for the lawmakers to do i had that feeling uh, a few times for example when i uh, gave the judgment in uh, vaidehi akash case uh, which is the kind of ruling authority now on uh, whether the developer of a uh, of a project you know with a particularly redevelopment project uh does he have any privity with the uh, or, or the or rather the society for whom he is developing the project does that society have any privity with third party purchasers who enter into agreements with the developer this was a very ticklish issue and i said no they don't have any privity but i felt really i mean i was struggling with my thoughts and i always felt uh, where would these people go you know most of these purchasers who were before me had paid their hard earned money to the developer to get a uh, a, a place of abode a, 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 a roof over their head but i felt this is something for the legislature to handle and it's part of my discipline as a judge that i can't transgress that's right that, yeah so you were always a judge who did justice according to law not despite the law <laughs> yes. and i think in the long run that actually has a far greater positive public impact than doing the opposite yeah uh, but at times this, you have got to be creative yes. as well because ma- many times uh, there are no clear answers 
and uh, you need to uh, tweak the existing system to some extent of course uh, so as not to be inconsistent with the that's right established legal but, models but, but sometimes you have to go a bit round it you would you would agree that the common law system that we have gives a lot of leaves a lot of play yes. in the joints for a judge to do yes, exactly absolutely. that absolutely we are not constrained yes, uh, correct by the sheer letter yeah, yeah. the black letter law yeah yeah there uh, is a free play in the joints as justice chandrachud has said in one of his judgments and and that is so important uh, yeah. for our whole system because every case in that sense is unique there's no formula for it yeah uh did you find the transition from being at the bar to becoming a judge difficult uh the only thing i missed when i i, I mean as a i mean from from a lawyer i went to the bench as a judge is uh, once you 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 heard the matters you've been in court for 5 years and you then you come back you come back to your chambers and you are sitting alone you miss that whole bonhomie and that whole atmosphere of the bar library that's that right. i did miss that's right but i mean this is of course uh, by way of an aside and a, in a little lighter vein but i didn't find it very difficult Let's get to Justice Kathawala. You you were with him uh, together as uh, juniors to Mr. Dada, and then of course both of you went to the bench. And post retirement, both of you share chambers. Yeah. So would you like to speak on that relationship? Yeah, we did have a very special relationship. I mean, that was from day one. I should say, as I said, when I uh, joined uh, Rafiq Dada, and I went to the library. Uh, uh, to meet the library secretary for uh, library membership the original site bar library membership and it was i think indu ben shroff the old lady who was a secretary right. and when she saw oh you joined mr dada oh, 10 days back a parsi boy you know young fair with a gold rimmed spectacles he joined mr dada he came to me for the library membership and is it turned out that gold rim spectacled parsi boy <laughs> turned out to be kathawala so on the very first day of uh, you know my uh, entry in the library i met him and since then we've been together we've been together as colleagues as uh, chamber colleagues with mr dada and then when we met, when we set up our first chamber you know it was he and myself we started our own chambers and uh, on the bench also i followed him maybe after a few years but i did and uh, even post retirement we are still together we share a chamber and where we do our arbitration consultancy practice so it has been a real long association yes that is really heartwarming because the bar and the bench is of course a place where you have you make long standing friendships and and warm relationships uh, and that's often not known to the outside world yes. about what sort of camaraderie there is at the bar and on the bench right. you were also known as a judge who did not differentiate between juniors and seniors and that of course is a very important uh, factor in in judgeship uh, but getting now to the actual judgments and many of your leading judgments for example you were part of the bench that struck down the beef ban in the state of maharashtra Uh, and you did so in part uh, the act was upheld and in part only struck yes. down yes uh, and you did so on the principle of article 21 and the right to privacy uh, did you feel that was a difficult judgment to grapple with conceptually I and mean, this is my personal thinking i mean as a judge i could not have doubted there was a binding supreme court judgment that's right which allowed uh, the ban on slaughter by itself uh but what the maharashtra government did in addition to a ban on slaughter it banned the very possession and consumption of beef so that is how we struck down section 5d of that act that's right which banned the very possession of uh, beef and there we said see you may you may ban the slaughter but if it's not unfit for human consumption then you can't say that consumption of beef is banned that goes against the personal autonomy of an individual which which the law mandates 
and uh, this is subsumed within the right of privacy. privacy. This is how we struck down That's that right. particular section. And in a separate judgment which I wrote, I also struck down the provision of the the criminal uh, uh, prosecution. prosecution provisions where the onus was cast on the accused. Reverse and the and at the very initial onus, I should say. Generally, law allows the onus to be cast on the accused after a certain threshold is met by the prosecution. Yes. But here, the law casts the onus straight away on the accused. And that is something which I struck down. And uh, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work on the, uh, in that uh, area for, for writing that judgment. Uh, hopefully, it has come out in the judgment. But yes, that is how it was. In, in fact, that judgment is a very erudite piece of legal writing because it also uh, manifested the principle that a judge has to rise above personal views and prejudices yes. uh, and decide according to law, which again, I think the balance that was struck in that judgment shows that. Yes. So, judge, to, to wind up, uh, what are your final thoughts on how we protect the independence of our judiciary and how we get better people to be judges uh, and we get more Justice Guptas on the bench? <laughs> uh, personally speaking, I feel just now the system that we have is the best that we have, that judges select judges. I don't think there is anything fundamentally wrong with this, except that there is, of course, a scope for improvement, introducing more transparency. There, there may be notes kept of, you know, the discussions between judges, etc. But so far, nobody has proposed a better system. It is better to leave it to the judges than to the politicians. That's my fundamental thought. Secondly, you need to uh, offer better terms to to the judges in terms of emoluments and uh, other uh, so that hopefully good people will take up judgeship and uh, i think we should we should continue with this system that we have just improve upon it rather than introducing a commission and an appointment commission and all that stuff I am of the firm view that we cannot have government nominees decide about appointment of judges. Thank you for sharing that wisdom with us, Justice Gupte. Uh, it gives a lot of hope and optimism for the future. And thank you very much uh, for, for I, sharing your thoughts. Uh, it was a pleasure with, talking to you. you. And thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. That was Justice Gupte taking us to the fundamentals of judgeship. Honesty of purpose, clarity of thought, and the felicity of expression. You just watched an episode of the Bombay Bar Association podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more such videos. We also have an audio podcast which dives a bit deeper and is available on all podcast apps.